Stuart, free will is a, uh, an important probe of consciousness. Uh, leading philosophers say the more you think about it, the more you, the more you analyze it, the, the more elusive it is. And you really can't get free will and you can't prove that it doesn't exist, you can't prove it does exist, and, and it becomes one of the biggest conundrums in the philosophy of mind. How do you see it? The mainstream approach is that consciousness is epiphenomenal and that we don't have free will. For example, if you and what I... What does it mean to be epiphenomenal? After the fact, having no bearing, just kind of along for the ride. The, fo the foam on the wave. The foam on the wave, the steam from the engine. Yeah. Uh, we are merely helpless spectators, as uh, T.A. Huxley said. Now, the reason I say that is that if you and I are talking back and forth, and you ask me a question, I answer right away. If you analyze the activity in my brain for what you said, it happens after I've responded. So the answer in mainstream uh, neuroscience is that I answer reflexively, non-consciously and have an after-the-fact illusion of being in conscious control when I said it. The same thing with hitting a tennis ball real fast or baseball. It's all too fast, and we act non-consciously. Now, and that's, that's a logical deduction. However, Benjamin Libet in the Great Experiments in 1979 and many other people have shown that, strangely enough, there's a backward referral of subjective experience in the brain. Libet did some amazing experiments, and the bottom line was that conscious experience, subjectivity can be referred backward in, in, in clock time. Now, that's not what they claimed. They claim that there's a readiness potential that you can see. Now you're talking about the forward. motor. You're talking about the right. motor experiments. I'm talking about the sensory experiments. The motor experiments are different. When do you move your finger? And that and that's arbitrary and, and confusing. The sensory experiments were he had somebody uh, who's having neurosurgery, brain surgery awake with their brain exposed. He could talk to him. He can access their finger. Let's say this finger for this part of the brain. He could stimulate the brain for this finger. He could stimulate the finger, record from the brain, stimulate from the brain and talk to the patient. The bottom line is that if he stimulates here, you get the conscious experience uh, almost immediately, 30 milliseconds, the time it takes to get to here. If you stimulate here, it takes 500 milliseconds. Uh, and if you, st but if you stimulate at other places in between, you get the evoked potential at 30 milliseconds, but if you don't get this ongoing activity of 500 milliseconds, there's no consciousness at, at the 30 milliseconds. The brain at 30 milliseconds knows whether or not there's going to be 500 milli more milliseconds of activity. Therefore, he concluded the consciousness subject of experience is referred backwards in time. This was ridiculed by uh, Dennett and Church Flynn and all the big time philosophers, and they kind of berated uh, Libet in the changing his tune slightly, but it hasn't really changed the facts. And since then, we've had a number of experiments that show backward time effects. For example, if you look at a computer screen of an image and get a, uh, a, a test of impedance, which is an emotional response, this happens before the image comes up. This was shown by Behrman Radin and, and Daryl Bem in mainstream uh, uh, psychology. And in quantum effects, you can the conscious, uh, conscious observer can make a choice of how to measure particle afterwards and determine its behavior. So this idea of backward time effect is probably intrinsic and entanglement, uh, according to Roger, and occurs in the brain and can rescue conscious free will. Because if you have this backward time effect, it means that the activity in my brain can actually send the results of the conscious decision backward in time so I can answer you in real time in conscious control. So to, it, to claim that free will can only be rescued by backward causation is a neon sign that says we have no blankety blank idea of how this thing works. I disagree with you. <laughs> I think we know how it works. Well, we know how, roughly how it works. There's, if there's a quantum collapse, according to Aharonov, for example, it sends the vectors forward and backwards in time. So if there's a collapse in my brain, that, for what you said, it sends it backward in time to when I can respond. And what you're doing is you're taking something that is being done at the photon level, the submicroscopic level, which has a lot of, 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 of uh, deals with the foundations of quantum mechanics, which is, 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 is complex, Limits uncertain. experiments were in the brain. They weren't in the photons. They were in the whole brain. My point is, is that I can't argue with the, with, with, with the physics because the physicists argue it. But what I can say is that your argument proves the, the, the impossibility of free will. If you have to go to backward causation to justify free will, free will is a hell of a problem. I disagree. I completely disagree. I don't think it's that. If it's there, it's going to be there all the time. If biology could evolve a mechanism to use quantum effects and to use backward time effects, wouldn't it, which would be absolutely beneficial in survival and evolution, wouldn't it do so? If a tomato or a rutabaga can use quantum coherence, wouldn't our brains?